Hi, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Thanks. Okay, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, hope everything's going well. So you're working on the, um, the second mini project, and I think there's a range of different things being done. So uh, that's, that's exciting, and I'm looking forward to uh, finding out more about those. Um, I guess the midterm uh, courseworks evaluations are still open. So if you do have any um, comments or feedback to give me on that, then please do. And I'll, be, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll summarize what we get back. Um, afterwards and um, let's see I have to leave a little bit early today because I have to go to a, a, a meeting with the Dean so um, young suck will be uh, taking over the last uh, quarter of an hour of class or so to tell and that'll be just talking about the uh, the practical that we'll be doing on Wednesday so I have some slides here on pitch tracking which is what it's going to be about um, any questions or comments before we get started? Well, is anything else going on? Okay. Good. All right. <clears throat> so this week's class is about pitch tracking. Um, pitch tracking has a long history as a as a as an algorithm, as something you do with machines, which is kind of why it's called pitch tracking, even though that's not the greatest name. If we was, we're not, because pitch is kind of an ambiguous word, we really mean fundamental frequency, the, the underlying common multiple of the harmonics. And tracking is slightly, has some different, slightly different kind of connotations. We just mean extraction, or classification or something. But anyway, that's what it's called. And uh, there are a range of different approaches. So it's quite interesting to look at the different approaches and to um, consider what their, what their different strengths and weaknesses are. So we'll look at, we'll sort of talk about the general problem, look at spectral approaches, which look at, as it were, the spectrum or the spectrogram and try and figure out what's going on. Time domain approaches, which just start with the waveform and try and work from there. And then we'll uh, I'll show you a few specific implementations that, we, that you might come across. So um, we're interested in pitch or the fundamental frequency um, for a number of reasons, but probably the most important is that it's a very uh, important part of uh, our percept of speech and of musical sounds. That is, when we, we hear speech, we hear the, the vowel, which comes from the resonances of the vocal track, the formants, but we also hear the pitch, which is the period of oscillation of the vocal folds. So this is like a, a spectrogram capture from the uh, live spectrogram processing thing. But if we just run that live, OK, so here it is. I don't know how well you can see that. But um, if I make a steady pitch, uh, we see the harmonics there, right? the set of different harmonics. And it's, this is the fundamental period. And then we have the multiples of those. Now, if I make, um, if I vary the pitch, uh, something like that, you can see the uh, the harmonics moving in proportion, right? That's that's the pitch varying. But if I change the um, timbre of my voice, the vowels and the resonances, I. You can see that the the, fun, the, the uh, harmonics stay the same, but it's just the strength of the different pitches. And in particular, if you move the if you if you can manipulate a resonance to fall onto a harmonic, oh look at that! Um, you can actually make the energy of the different harmonics be stronger than, say, the lowest harmonic. So that's um, and there's like there's this Tuvalan, what is it? It's the, the throat singing, which is all about that, is about taking the resonances and picking out harmonics to make it sound um, different. 
So we see that the whole, the problem is complicated. We're looking for that common pattern of harmonics, but we can't do the thing that we did in the first, in the pitch tracking mini practical, where we just tried to find the most, the strongest harmonic. That's not really going to work. Um, the, re the applications for this stuff, the, the reason there's been so much work on it is because of this idea of uh, source filter coding for voice, and particularly for, for telephony, for voice communication, voice transmission. If we can um, separate out the pitch from the filter, from the excitation, then we can encode them separately, and that can give us a very efficient encoding, which is just allows us to use low bandwidth voice coding. So that's, there's been a lot of work trying to take natural speech, telephony speech, and being able to reliably extract the pitch that you can then just store as a separate parameter. But of course, in music, where we want to do things like transcription, then um, pitch tracking is also very interesting, and a lot of the same, it's basically the same problem, trying to find the fundamental frequency. Yeah? Yeah. But, uh, but as for the most up piece, and uh, there is a part of it that quite works because it usually has a high pitch. But as for there is a part, there is an internal with it. Uh, it the, the area usually has a low pitch and it's mingled with the, the background yeah. music. So I'm, I'm not sure if it is a very efficient way to extract the, this pitch from the background music. Yeah. So that's, I mean, so that a lot of times, um, a lot of the work that's been done in, in speech pitch tracking kind of assumes that there's just the speech, the only, the only periodicity present is the speech. In music, we have this problem that very often there's many instruments present because that's the structure of, of uh, polyphonic music. And then a lot of the assumptions you might make are not going to work so well. So you have to make different, you have to have more sophisticated ways, more robust ways to decide which period is most, most strong. So we'll, I'll talk about that as we move on. Um, so we'd like to be able to extract pitch simply to be able to maybe eff efficiently store a signal so we can reconstruct it. Or we may actually just want to get the pitch as a, in its own right, that actually there's, you know, obviously the reason that we're sensitive to pitch, the reason we care about pitch in speech is because it does carry information. In, uh, you know, in languages like English, it carries so-called prosodic information, which is non-lexical information. It shows you where, which words are stressed, where the phrasing is, uh, maybe something about, you know, your affect or emotional state. In other languages, in tonal languages like Mandarin, it actually has a lexical uh, relevance so that the different, a different pitch shape on, on a word will change its actual meaning, which word is involved. So pitch extraction in speech is important for getting information, and of course in, in music it's the melody, which can be kind of the whole point. But there are a bunch of different times when it becomes diff uh, tricky. Actually, I didn't show you that, but if I go something like, if I go, ah, uh, it's clear, it's pretty unambiguous what the pitch is. We could all take a sinusoid oscillator and match that to the pitch pretty well. But if I go, ah, uh, it's sort of, a, the, there's a pitch there, but it's not nearly so well defined. I've got a, what's called creaky voice because I'm not getting every cycle of the pitch. And so that's the kind of thing where suddenly the, even the writer, it's not clear what you really want your algorithm to generate, and you expect your algorithm to have problems. And then there are problems like Jing mentioned, where you've got multiple pitches present, and like, well, which is the one you want? And you, know, you can expect, again, the algorithm's going to have trouble deciding that. OK, so here is um, a little bit of singing from the Marvin Gaye track. Heard it on the grapevine. So let's just listen to that. And this is the spectrogram, and we see, you know, this is just the isolated voice. And uh, it's, you know, you can see these very strong, very clear harmonics. Um, but even that, he's got a little bit of this kind of uh, raucous voice in that first note. And what we see here is that these harmonics are not, not a complete. Like over here, it's very, very clear that they're just a set of harmonics. But here we have some stuff going on in between the harmonics which is the sort of the slightly rough quality to his voice. And what we see is something that looks like maybe an octave below. That there's sort of extra, hum, extra harmonics sort of midway in between the more dominant harmonics. And you can see it in this spectral slice here. There are these peaks here. 
And it's like he's got two kind of modes of oscillation in his vocal folds, one slower than the other, like maybe every other cycle. This is the actual waveform here. And you can see these sort of lower peaks, which are happening every, um, every one of the major cycles, but there's sort of something else going on. Uh, let's see, we're looking for something where the, every second cycle or so has an extra peak, right? The lower, a longer period. And you can see some kind of modulation in there where the, there are these other peaks coming in at a lower, a lower rate. So that's, you know, that's a, not a particularly unusual piece of voice, but it is something that makes this situation a little more difficult. And you can see, you know, it happens elsewhere here. Whereas here at the end, very nice, well-defined harmonic spectrum. And uh, pretty, what that corresponds to is a fairly uh, clear, exact repetition of the pitch cycles. Um, another thing to notice here is, because the way he's singing, again, the fundamental is not the strongest harmonic here. It's sort of it's pretty close to being as equally strong. But out here, it's actually the third harmonic that's the strongest one. And in here, it's one, two, three, four, f the fifth harmonic up here, which is getting the most energy. So, um, and you, that's reflected in the fact that even though the period here is this, this many, you know, this, this, this much period in time, we see that within each period, there's a strong element of the something which is going about five times as fast. There's this, these little peaks in here are the fifth harmonic here which you can see is very, very prominent in the time domain. So, you know, the, it's pretty clear listening to the signal and looking at the spectrogram what the appropriate pitch track should be. Basically, we want to follow this fundamental here. But it's not so easy to come up with an algorithm that's going to do this automatically. There are some other problems that come up uh, where you have to decide when to report no pitch, like there are these gaps in between here and the sort of, you don't really want to report anything. That's mainly governed by an energy threshold, but again, you have to decide what that threshold is. That's called voice activity detection. And for the purposes of actually rendering this down to, to the music, right, this is the sort of the, the common music notation for what, what we heard, or want somebody's version of it. There's this issue of deciding when the notes change, that here, you know, it's more or less there are some breaks in between the, the words, the syllables, but the pitch track is more or less continuous, right? This is uh, lose, which is written here as like, you know, set a little st series of steps, but it's much more of a continuous contour, right? There's no, there's no obvious segmentation. This is a, a very common problem in dealing with, with sung, sung music. And then here's the other problem that Jim, Jim brought up, which is that, okay, we've got the, uh, the voice, <coughs> but actually what we're probably going to end up with is the mix. So it's the same voice, but now we've got all the other instruments, the backing vocals, the strings and the drums and everything. And now the signal, you can still see these harmonics here, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And so now, you know, again, a listener can quite easily pick out the voice there and could, you know, in, in a, some kind of psychological experiment, could try and match the pitch to the pitch at different points to try and, you know, show they really were hearing individual notes. But the, the job of trying to do this automatically is much harder. Um, You know, one way of thinking about how we're going to find the fundamental here, which is the common spacing between the harmonics, is just to try a bunch of different possible sets of fundamentals and see which one matches the pa patterns best. But if we do that here, we're going to get different kind of uh, fundamentals that happen to match some of the voice and some of the background. And we're going to get these sort of in interactions between the different signals that are present that's going to definitely mess things up. One of the popular ways of trying to do this kind of task where you might want to re re find, identify all the notes is to sort of re uh, sequentially apply something which tries to find the, most, the strongest note and then try and filter out all that note, all those harmonics, 
and then repeat on, on the residual, which works okay, but typically the noise builds up as every time you try to remove it, you get a little bit of extra um, degradation of the signal. But that's a, it's worked out okay. All right, so that's the general um, idea of, of pitch tracking. So now let's look at some specific approaches. So here's the spectrogram again. This is the spectrogram of the isolated voice. And this is the spectrogram uh, of the full mix of the, of the music. They're on the grayscale now. What I've done here is I've just taken for every column, I found the most intense bin, and I've plotted that in red. And so you can see, as we saw, you know, up here, it's not the, it's not the fundamental. In fact, the fundamental is not the strongest. It doesn't have the highest energy for any of this note here. And down here, as we noted, it goes up to being the fifth harmonic is the strongest. It's got the most energy. And then if we mix in the instrumentation as well, then suddenly we get, you know, it being captured by something down here, like the bass line or something, as being the strongest note. So um, this is not a very robust way of, of following the pitch. It turns out that for some musical tasks, it works out OK, right? For the piano, it wasn't that bad, because it turns out, well, the piano doesn't have this resonance thing. And, it, and it, uh, if you record it appropriately, then the often, very often the fundamental is the strongest the strongest harmonic, but uh, something doesn't work for voice. So we can take this pitch track, and we can re-synthesize the sinusoid with that, and we can listen to what that sounds like, and that's this. So you can sort of hear that it's, it's picking up this high. This is like a third harmonic would be an octave and a fifth higher than the, fun, the correct fundamental. So you can sort of hear this in here, but it's jumping all over the place. Yeah? Is it possible to, to set, set up a mask for energy to separate the background instrument and, and the voice? Like the, uh, the last uh, scenario in the PSP part, there is, there is a way to try to do the FTFT, to try to uh, to fix the spectrum. Yeah. 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 There are a lot of things you could do. So you can use time frequency masking to if you if you've got a way of taking a spectrogram like this and then re re reconstructing the original signal, then you can start messing with the spectrogram and reconstructing and see what you get. Typically a spectrogram is not a spectrogram which is the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform is not quite enough information to do a reconstruction. Because in order to do the inverse short time Fourier transform of every frame, you also need the phase values. But when you have the original signal, you can keep the phase values, store the phase and the magnitude, the magnitude of the spectrogram. You could then modify these magnitudes by, like, for instance, taking out, setting to zero certain frequency components. Then you could use the original phase, invert by inverting every column, and then doing overlap add. And you'd, uh, you'd get the. Um, you get some signal back, which is modified signal. It's it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, quick and dirty, because if you if you modify just individual bins here, it's not entire. It's not completely uh, clear what that means in terms of the original signal. But clearly, if you take out all the energy down here, then there's going to be no energy in the, in the reconstruction. Um, so that's uh, that that's an interesting component in a lot of these advanced signal pro uh, music processing systems. I guess um, it might, at this point, it might be worth thinking about what, how could we make this system, how could we do better than this, right? So obviously, we want to pick a single value for every frame, at least at most one value. But, and it's going to be a value where there's a lot of energy, right? It's in some, in some one, it's going to be the most intense value in some domain. But what, what, what are we doing wrong here that we could improve? Any, any suggestions, any ideas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great idea. So we're saying, um, to first order, 
the problem here is that all these different harmonics are about the same energy. And so, if, well, you know, if that's, if that's what he's doing when he's singing, is like he's generating six or eight harmonics of approximately equal energy. And if we, choose, if we try and choose the largest one, it could be any of them just by random variations. How about if we just weight them so that we uh, always try and, if, if there are a bunch of, in the case where they're all equal energy, we choose the lowest one, we could just weight them in inverse proportion to the frequency or some, you know, inverse proportion to the square root of the frequency, something like that, such that the, uh, the lowest one of equal amplitude would always get the, the weight. That would, that would probably work. I mean, it would work pretty well here, right? Because, you know, all I have to do is take the worst case ratio between these two, just make sure that the weight falls off faster than that, and then this is going to be the peak that, that comes out. You have to be a little bit careful with 1 over f type things, because obviously as f gets close to zero, you get weights that can come um, that can get a little better control, but you know you could come up with something that was did the right thing close to zero. So, Yeah. 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 Um, there's a there's a simpler form of that. So we could say, well, we don't know what the best weighting is, so we want to set it. We could just, you know, tune it by hand on a few test examples until we get. We could have some parametric weighting function with some parameter. We could try a bunch of values and see which one works best. What you're suggesting, which is some kind of online adaptive thing, is kind of interesting, where you sort of have something which tries to all the time update its weight to, to improve performance. The problem with that is you need some kind of supervision, right? You need, you need some way to decide whether the value is getting better or worse. And if you don't have ground truth, that's, you know, you have to find something else. But that's certainly an interesting idea. We'll see something, we'll see something a little bit like that later on. Any other ideas about principles about this signal that we could use to try and improve its, uh, improve our ability to track the pitch? What's wrong with this red pitch track? There's something about, I think if you looked at this, it's like it's on its face, it's quite implausible as a pitch track for the voice, right? But only the fundamental frequency uh, is uh, the actual uh, frequency that the voice is uh, tracked. Yeah. So, so, how could, so the fun, we only want the fundamentals. So how could we reject these things as not being fundamentals? So, I mean, what it suggests to me is like, if you have this peak here, it's like, well, I better just check that I'm not on the second harmonic. You might want to check frequency, uh, half the frequency. And like, if there's a very plausible peak at half the frequency, it's like, uh-oh, I've obviously gone too high. And so, you, and you could, you know, you could do it in theory for all the submultiples. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, 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 if the technique in the, uh, in the last class, <coughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Spectrum, yeah, yeah, and uh, just assume that they have the same harmon harmonic structure yeah. and try to implement them to the inverse for this transformation. Yeah. To implement the same har harmonic structure in the, in the nice time cycle and try to extend them. Right. So that, I'll be talking, I mean, that's, that's coming up. But that's the idea that we actually, rather than just looking for a single fundamental, we're looking for a pattern of harmonics and we expect them to be in certain weights and so we can see if what we get matches that. Um, the other thing I was, I'm looking at is like, well, this, this as a, the red line as a whole, the red data as a whole has these jumps in it, right? And the jumps, we don't expect, we, there's no way a voice can do this. Maybe yodeling is something like this, but it's, it's not very likely. If you see this sudden jump, um, you probably think, oh, I'm, I'm actually you know, going, sorry, that's my mail notifier. You, you think that you're making a, an, an, an error, that you're, you're uh, erroneously skipping between two different values, and probably any one of them. And so one, probably only one of them is correct. So one thing we could do is to try and 
enforce a system such that the pitch tracks are continuous. Okay, and that's something we can, we can do quite nicely with something like a hidden Markov model. Right? <laughs> okay. All right, so this is um, a way of doing the, something like the idea of weighting and something like the idea of um, enforcing a particular spectral template. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to, uh, the, uh, the one way of thinking about what we're doing is we're trying to weight the different harmonics, saying, okay, well, there are, if we have a particular fundamental, we expect to see a bunch of harmonics. So we should um, attack, we should increase the, we should regard those harmonics as evidence for that fundamental. And so we want some way of taking a harmonic, taking a particular frequency and saying, well, that's evidence for a pitch at that frequency or a pitch at half that frequency or a third or a quarter or a fifth, etc. And so one way we can think about doing that is as a convolution. So we have a spectrum with a set of harmonics. And then we, we convolve it with a template like this that will add some weight to, the, to that particular frequency, but also to the frequency at half that, a third that, a quarter that, etc. Now, in a linear frequency space, that would be this, this spacing here would depend on the actual frequency. But if we use a log frequency axis, such that a doubling in frequency is always the same amount of space, and you know, uh, one third of the frequency is the same amount of space, then it becomes a linear operation. That for every frequency peak on this log axis, we can literally just do, do a linear convolution against this template like this, and we can get some kind of integrated evidence for all the different uh, fundamentals like this. So here, in the original spectrum, the third harmonic was the highest. I guess it's this point over here. But when we, when we convolve it like this, we get energy here, you know, in, not energy, but uh, a score or intensity at this fundamental from this peak being convolved with this peak. But we also get energy at the same point here with this peak and its convolution you know, due to that peak, that when we convolve this against here, we get some energy. We also get some energy adding up here. This one, this peak gives us some energy here. So all these pieces add up, and then all these frequencies which are consistent with this fundamental end up giving us a, a maximum, a largest, the largest peak here. So it's, uh, it's like matched filtering, that we're expecting this kind of um, structure, well, this is the, the match filter, so it's the flipped version of the structure we expect, such that if we see exactly this, this will give us the largest inner product against this, this sort of set of harmonics. So I, get, I, I, I don't feel like I explained that terribly clearly, but you get the general idea that we're trying to sum up energy that's consistent with a particular fundamental, and that in the, in the log frequency domain, we can do this simply by applying these these weights, but the weights give the greatest amount of contribution to the fundamental and then they have reducing strength of contributions for the other, other harmonics, but that's okay because it turns out that only the fundamental will have, all, all, these, all these harmonics will contribute energy to the fundamental, so it's probably going to come out on top. So this is the log frequency spectrogram. It's the same as spectrogram we saw before, but now I've just warped the the frequency axis to be logarithmic. And here are the locally largest peaks, which is the same pattern of jumping around that we saw on linear frequency, because I haven't changed the magnitudes. I'm not yeah. sure if the, uh, the harmonics don't just compose with the, a little, uh, uh, compose with the pulse uh, sat satisfy the, the normal temperature distribution by the, uh, the like uh, uh, this thing you do assign yeah. Yeah. You mean this shape here? Yeah, OK. So, you know, um, the argument I made, these things would just be straight, would be, would be lines, right? They're not, they're not pulses at all. They're just, it's like, I expect to see some energy at the fundamental and then some energy at half and third. And, but I've given them a little bit of width here, which is just a, Ga it is a Gaussian, a normal distribution, as you say, um, just because there's going to be some uncertainty about exactly where these go and by by putting a little width on here, there's some blurring going on. Um, these, the, the peaks that we observe in the spectrum are not straight lines, just largely because of the time window, the time window that we use in analysis that caused some blurring in frequency. 
And then, you know, this is these little, the, the, the width here is sort of, we, we would get the same result if we actually used a line spectrum. It's just um, we might get some problems with, alien, with sampling, that we, the, one third of the frequency might not fall exactly on a frequency bin. So we might, you know, if we just made it in, totally narrow, then we might miss it altogether. So by putting a little, little bit of blurring around, we, we don't have to worry so much about our frequency density. But um, in, in principle, it would be the same if we were take, it would be more or less the same if we took just the exact points. Okay, so this is the log frequency spectrogram, and then this is the result after applying that kind of uh, matched filter. And uh, it's kind of dark here, but it does the right thing, that now, the, uh, instead of jumping around, it's the fundamental that, that dominates most of the time, except, of course, in between, where we get some other weird frequency. And so now we can take that pitch track and put it on a sine wave, and we get this. So that, um, that, hmm? <laughs> well, it's not as pretty as the original singing, but the pitch sounds about right. Um, there's this little blip up here where, we, you know, the point we get a, a higher frequency coming out, which we can hear, and there's sort of some rumbling in between, which doesn't come through too much on the speakers. But generally, when he's actually singing, it's getting the pitch right. So that works a lot better. Um, although, to get that to work, I had to play with these weights here a little bit. That it was like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that simple. It was uh, a little bit of trial and error to get it to look, look right. <clears throat> okay, another thing we can do is, is the Kepstrom. And um, this is this kind of weird idea but that's been very successful and very powerful. So the, then the word Kepstrom comes from taking spectrum and flipping the order of the first four letters, as opposed to the spec mode, which Jing told us about last week, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, because it's like taking the spectrum, but it's taking the spectrum of something else. So the basic idea is this. If we look at these slices of the spectrum, right, this is the, the slice at 0.75 seconds, this is the slice at 3.3 seconds, we see these harmonics, and uh, we're saying the thing that shows us that there's a pitch there is that these harmonics occur at regular, regular spacings, right? And they're, in this case, they're always like, you know, 450 hertz apart. They're at 450, 900, 1350, whatever. And same here, they're about. 300 hertz, something like that. So what we're seeing actually is a spectrum that has periodicity, right? This has periodicity along the frequency axis. That's what the harmonics mean. They're always at the same spacing relative to each other. So what the Kepstrom is, is you take this, which is the log magnitude spectrum, and you take the Fourier transform of that, and then what you get is something like this, where now it's like, well, there's a big term at DC because this thing is now, you know, if it's log, it's kind of the average level is arbitrary, it's just the gain, but it has this kind of strong, you know, this, is, this is not a zero mean signal, what it, this has got some offset. So this is, there's some low, low index terms. So what we're doing is we're taking this and we're representing it with, with sines and cosines. Actually, we're taking the full symmetric version of this, it's the magnitude, magnitude spectrum of a real signal is symmetric. So actually, it's only cosine terms that you end up using, because the cosine terms are symmetric Fourier bases. So we take a bunch of cosines and try and, exp try and represent this signal with cosines. But because we've got these peaks here, if it were a straight impulse train, an impulse train comes from summing up all the multiples of that period in equal amplitude. We expect to see a set of strong harmonics at the period of these, where these impulses occur. And so we get some here, and here we see it even more strongly that here's the stuff at low period, but here are these quite sharp harmonic, sharp cosine terms coming from the terms that are required to represent this periodic p impulse-like structure in the, 
in the spectrum. So it's confusing to think about because we're taking, we're, we're taking what we normally think of, what we're taking the frequency axis and treating it like we normally treat the time axis, right? So now it's as if this was a time domain waveform and it has a clear period that we'd hear it as a buzz. And so when we took its spectrum, we'd see these harmonics here. But actually this is a frequency domain spectrum and it's the log magnitude of frequency. It's, it's important that you use the log because that then takes these higher harmonics and still gives them this sharp structure that gives you the, the harmonics, the, the basis terms coming out here. But the bottom line is that you get um, a, a function of, the, of a time index, which in keeping with Kepstrom is called q frequency instead of frequency. And uh, it's going to have a, a peak at the, at the fundamental and a multiple of the fundamental. So here's the, the spectrogram again. And here is the plot of doing, for every frame, doing this inverse Fourier transform. It's Fourier transform with log magnitude. And you get these, this stuff down here, which is the, the low frequency. This actually describes the um, overall, you know, there's a low order cosine term, so it's the overall shape. But then these higher Q frequency terms which show you the fundamental. And so if you sort of mask out the low period, which is the very high frequencies, no, wait, low Q frequency, small, small lag, yeah, it'd be stuff that would be highly spaced in frequency. If you ignore those, then you just take the largest value, you get something like this. If we resynthesize that, It's mostly right. Here, it actually did have some trouble, again, with the, the second harmonic here being even higher than the first harmonic. That's to say, there's sort of competition between these two peaks as which one is largest. Um, the higher harmonic, what would that mean? It means like every other, what does it mean? I don't know. When we resynthesize this, now these are in, these are period rather than frequency, right? So when his, when his voice goes up, the, the Kepstrom track goes down. And so these things are now, when it jumps up, instead of being an, an octave too high, it's an octave too low. And so when we heard that, it was kind of like more, we didn't, you could still hear the, the right fundamental because um, this one was so low that it's sort of not easy to perceive in here. So it's a different kind of error that you make with this kind of s structure, but it's still sort of, making some errors. But you can imagine doing the kinds of things we were talking about to try and uh, prefer the right capstral peak here so you could remove some of these errors and make it work better. Capstral pitch, track, pitch trackers are probably, well, they're, 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 they were very popular in speech coding for a while. So the Spectma which was just which was you know introduced by Jane last week. It has the same idea of um, you know what we expect to see is a spectrum which is some fundamentals and a set of harmonics here based on the fundamental, but we don't know what shape these harmonics are going to be in. But we do know that if if we get it right if we're able to correctly estimate the set of harmonics on a particular fundamental, then the obs observed spectrum we get will be a simple, we'll get a, very, we'll get a sparse basic spectrum, and we'll get a good match if, when we convolve the sparse spectrum with the true harmonic, with the correct <coughs> set of harmonic weights to give us the final spectrum. And so you can, you can try and uh, blindly estimate this harmonic structure, a set of harmonic weights for each fundamental, such that you, you know, get the, the most simple version out here while still being able to correctly preserve, uh, correctly predict the actual observed spectrum. And it's a very, very smart idea, a very nice idea for situations where you think the signal is made up of multiple overlapping notes each of which has the same harmonic structure, such that, so that this generative model of a set of fundamentals can evolve with a set of harmonic weights on a log frequency axis 
is, uh, is the right way to describe the signal. There's actually a lot of um, current interest in these um, signal processing methods that use sparsity as a principle. Typically, you know, for the last 50 years in signal processing, we'll, often when we try and optimize, we try and optimize the mean squared error because we have these nice techniques that you can differentiate the mean squared error and that you get a closed form solution. But mean squared error gives you different answers than looking for a sparse solution, which is where you say, I don't mind if some values are large, but I just want most of the values to be, almost, to be zero or close to zero. Right? Mean squared error says, I really don't like large values because their square is even larger, so it tries to make everything kind of small, but it doesn't matter if, they're, if a lot of them are small. A sparse solution says you can make some of the values large, but let's make most of the values almost zero. And typically, um, whereas um, mean squared error sums up the squares of the values, one way to get a sparse solution is to sum up the absolute values of the values, the L1 norm of the solution. And that um, gives you very different answers, tends to give you these, these much more spa sparse answers. And so there are quite a lot of techniques to try and use that. Um, we saw, we've seen the sinusoid model as a way of describing a signal. And it's very nice and uh, it's very easy to think about and to work with. And so we can actually try and do uh, our pitch tracking based on a sinusoidal analysis. So here's the initial spectrogram of the original of the solo voice. And the red lines are the outputs of a sinusoidal modeling system, something like SPEAR. And so it just shows you where each of those uh, sinusoids occurs. And then for every frame, we can look at the sinusoids we have and try and figure out which fundamental is most, explains the most of them. And that's what I plotted here. Um, actually, this is kind of faked, but if you did this right, then you'd get this green track here, which is the actual fundamental of the, uh, of the, of the singing. If you repeat that on the mix, now, because there's so many more instruments present, the set of sinusoid peaks that you get in any frame is much more complicated, right? Because we have all these, in addition to the voice harmonics, we have all these different spectral peaks coming from the instruments in the background. So now it would be quite a lot harder to correctly identify um, the common fundamental, but you, know, you, could, you could at least think about how to do that problem. But it's, it's, it's kind of the same as the, 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 the continuous weighting we did by convolution, where you can have it as a more discrete problem where you have a set of discrete frequencies and you try and optimally find a frequency that, that, is, common, that is consistent with all of them. And then depending on how good your sinusoid model is, it can give you good robustness to background noise because maybe that background energy won't even get into the sinusoidal representation. And uh, that can give you some nice properties. So that's sort of looking at it from the spectrum, which is you know, what you get from if you look at the, the spectrogram and you think about how you're going to do it. But actually, you know, it's period the fundamental, the pitch, is actually periodicity in the signal, which is essentially a time domain property. So um, you might as well, you, you, there's a strong argument for just working on this directly from the time domain. So here are the time domain waveforms of the two different little excerpts of the voice that we've been looking at. And you can see that there are these very clear, if you just look at the, the, the maximum or the minimum value, the, the most negative value of the cycle, you can clearly see this period here, which is the pitch, and the same here. Here we've got some sub-peaks as well, but still there's a very clear um, periodic structure to the signal, which is, which is what we're trying to get out. Um, another nice thing about working in the time domain is that you don't have to actually perform a Fourier transform, so you can save a lot of computation. So some of the earliest approaches to pitch tracking were based on this. And there's one um, scheme which was developed in the 60s by uh, Ben Gold and Larry Rabiner called the Gold, Gold Rabiner Pitch Tracker. And it was based on um, this kind of hard to classify approach 
where they defined a set of features. So they would say, well, here's a typical piece of waveform, and we're going to have these six kind of feature detectors. And what M1 is going to fire every time there's a local maximum that's larger than zero. M2 will fire every time there's a local maximum that's larger than the preceding local minimum. M3 will fire every time there's local maximum that's larger than the preceding local maximum. And then we'll have the same, we'll have three things that work on minima as well. The minima lo lower than zero, smaller than the preceding local maximum, and smaller than the preceding local minimum. So you get a waveform like this, and you have these six different event detectors, and they're sort of spiking at different times. And then for each one, you calculate just the, 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 time, since the time between successive spikes. And then you've got these six kind of you know, best estimates of the local period, and just vote between those. And uh, you know, any, for any given waveform, some of these will get it right, some of these will get it wrong. But most of the time, if there's a period which more than one of them agrees on, or the one that they most, most of them agree on, it's going to be the right period. And it's pretty cheap to implement, and it was pretty robust. So that's, uh, you know, it's going to work pretty well on these that clearly the local minima are going to do well and, uh, you know, a few of the others. So you can sort of see how it works. <coughs> um, of course, what you're really getting at is the similarity, the self-similarity between the signal itself and the standard signal itself at a different time. And the standard way to, to capture that is with autocorrelation. The difference is the autocorrelation requires quite a lot of multiplies per point, whereas that sort of simple pitch tracking tries to, period feature tracking tries to avoid a lot of that. But if you're not so uh, limited for computation, then you can use autocorrelation instead. So here, it, here are our two little segments of waveform, and here are the actual autocorrelations over these entire windows. And here you can see, yes, this this period here comes out very strongly. And here, again, this is the, remember, this is a signal with a very strong fifth harmonic. And uh, we do still see these strong peaks, although we do see some pretty strong uh, intermediate peaks at the, at the period of the fifth harmonic. Of course, this is the thing with autocorrelation. You get this nice peak at the correct period, but then at twice the period, three times the period, you also get peaks, because if it matches a shift of one period, it's also going to match a shift of two and three periods. So although this is a very strong, very clear basis for picking, for identifying the, the period, it does have, it does present these sort of methodological problems of how to decide which one of these peaks you want to keep, because you want to keep the largest peak, except the largest peak's always at zero lag, so you have to have some way of ignoring that one. But you, are, you do expect to see other large peaks at uh, different frequencies, which you want to ignore. So there's some difficulty in choosing the thresholding. But um, with the right approach, you can get a pretty good result. And so here are the uh, auto smoothed, locally normalized autocorrelations for the solo voice and for the mixture, the, the mix. And then I've just taken the local peak and highlighted it in red, again, with some windowing to avoid ambiguities. And uh, that, that works out pretty well. Again, it's lag-based, so when the pitch goes down, the period goes up, and we see these, these peaks here. And this is, um, yeah, this is, this is probably the most effective mechanism for pitch tracking, at least for um, signals which only have a single period, solo signals. But all of these things I've shown you so far are just treating each frame independently. They're just looking, you know, whatever it is, that spectrum, and trying to find the right period. Um, in fact, the thing we spoke about at the beginning, this idea of like, well, if you see something jump suddenly, that's just not very likely as a, as a pitch track. You can sort of deal with these with, with post-processing. So you maybe take that raw output as a first stage, but then you have some kind of post-processing on it to, to eliminate these jumps. And there are a couple of ways you can do this. Median filtering is a very simple and popular scheme where you just take a window of some length, like you, know, you take like half a second or a quarter of a second, and um, you calculate the median within that window, and then you replace 
the value in the middle with the median value across the whole window. If you have a few jumps that sort of, you know, suddenly jump up to an octave higher, the median, which is just taking all the values and taking the median value, those things will come out of the edges of the median, they'll, they'll disappear. Um, whereas if you took some other kind of average, like a mean, then extreme outliers will influence the mean. Outliers don't affect a median. So median filtering can be pretty good. It sort of will fill in gaps, uh, short gaps. But it's uh, is a little bit weird in that you're not actually using the current median, current value. You're just taking sort of some some average over a, a longer time window. The more potentially responsive method is to use the Viterbi path. Viterbi path is basically fitting some kind of state model, like a hidden Markov model, and um, optimizing the likelihood of the, of the value that you choose as the correct value based both on how good the local score is, so what the local peak is, but also based on some uh, penalty associated with jumps. So you have a transition matrix for your Markov model saying how likely is it that the pitch at time t is a certain pitch given that the pitch at time t minus 1 was some other pitch. And so by, by manipulating those transition probabilities, you can make it very expensive for it to have a large jump. But then you can, by using the Viterbi algorithm, you can jointly optimize the overall um, cost or likelihood associated with a particular track. And you can find, very efficiently it turns out, you can find um, the most, the, the, the best, mo lo least co lowest cost path through a given data set. And that is the other thing that's very important and effective in pitch tracking. Yeah? Yeah, so um, there are some good implementations in MATLAB for, for the Viterbi path. I use um, this HMM toolbox from Kevin Murphy, and it has a, I mean, you can, you can actually implement it yourself pretty easily, but it's always nice to have someone else's that's been debugged. So there are, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty simple algorithm, and uh, you, can, you can find some implementations for it. Okay, so let's just, uh, I, want, I have to leave in a couple of minutes. A few examples. Yin is something, is a, it's available on MATLAB. It was written by Alan de Chevenier and Hideki Kawahara um, in the late 90s. And it basically is an autocorrelation based pitch tracker. It just takes the autocorrelation of every frame, finds the, the, the best period, and that gives you these frame independent estimates. However, it does a couple of things which are quite clever. Um, it has this idea of progressive normalization. So you want to normalize the autocorrelation each frame by the total energy. But instead of doing it by, by the energy over the whole frame, it sort of does it on every point is normalized by the average of the points up to that lag. And this has this nice way of um, making sure that the lag, at the, the, the peak at zero isn't the largest peak. And it also does it, it actually works rather than calculating straight autocorrelation, it calculates the difference between uh, the, the waveform at different periods and it looks for the smallest difference, which is sort of directly related to the largest autocorrelation. But it just means that it can actually choose the best peak by looking, having a, a threshold which is fairly, fairly constant and looking for any differences that fall below that threshold. This is um, the pitch tracker we t tend to use as the reference for most of our work in, in the lab. Um, Sigmund is a PD patch that was actually written by Miller Puckett, the guy who wrote the rest of PD. That's his kind of thing. And it's actually a very complex patch. But, um, and it does a lot of stuff, which uh, Young Suk will show you in a few minutes. But um, it, it basically does a sinusoidal model. Then it tries to find a frequency that maximizes this um, goodness score, which is the sum over the harmonic multiples k of the energy at the, the, the k th frequency downweighted by something that's sort of like 1 over k but it's got this alpha, so for small k, it is less than 1 over k, but it's got this 1 over, approximately 1 over f weighting, calculates this and chooses the best frequency, but it's also got some other stuff to smooth along time and to try and find when no changes occur. And that's what we're going to be playing with on Wednesday. And then Ansi Klappery is this guy from Finland who's done a lot of work on music pitch tracking. 
He's produced a several systems for polyphonic pitch tracking, which try and get multiple notes out. And he had a paper in 2006 on a kind of modified, simplified system. And uh, he's got this sort of uh, salience function for particular periods, which is related to taking the energy of the uh, spectrum of the multiples, the harmonics of the particular period. But he has this weighting function. So this is what, getting back to what we were talking about before. And this weighting function, he um, optimizes empirically. So he's got a bunch of music signals, and he tries to find the best weighting function to give the best results. And he, it, he ends up having it as the product of two, two different functions. One is a function of the actual period, the pitch, and one is a function of the frequency of the particular harmonic of that pitch. So it's a function of both tau and m, the harmonic number. And then he optimizes these functions. The solid lines here are his numerically optimized values, and the dotted lines are fitting them with simple functions, a proportional function here and a 1 over f function here. But he finds that you know they, you can sort of op, you can get optimal results just by sort of trying to set these parameters to do the best, and they're reasonably uh, stable across different conditions. He has two ways of doing multiple f zeros, either by finding the best one, taking it out, and trying to repeat, or he sets up this joint optimality thing. So if you you trying to find the set of different fundamentals that optimize the match between your observed spectrum and the the, the complete set of fundamentals, which, give, which gives slightly different results, but because you have to search over all possible combinations of fundamentals, this is much more computationally expensive. So that's pretty much it. Um, pitch tracking is important for both for speech processing and for music. Um, the spectrum is kind of the natural way to think about it. If you at least you've, if you've been looking at pitch as a in the in the spectrogram. Um, but actually, the time domain is, in some senses, an equivalent way, or at least a, some, sometimes a computationally simpler way of doing it, and it's pretty effective. All right, now I have to rush off, so I'll hand over to um, Young Suck to tell you about the uh, stuff we're going to be doing, the practical. Okay, so yeah, from now on, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, this week's practical. Mm. Okay, let's see. So this week's practical, uh, you will do the pitch tracking, right? And um, this is the main patch where uh, you will experiment uh, with pitch tracking. So, so here is uh, we have one micro microphone input input and one sound file input. So you can either experiment with your own voice or the sound file we provide or your uh, choice. <laughs> and um, the main um, pitch tracker that we will use is this function called Sigmon, which is the latest version of um, Miller Puckett's uh, implementation of pitch tracking that um, Professor Alice just described in, in the lecture. So um, there are uh, mainly three ways of um, operating this segment uh, patch. So, so the first one is tracking the continuous pitch of the input file, which is operated by this pitch um, parameter. And here, um, env is uh, capturing all the amplitude in continuous time as well. So here um, we have uh, two output from this segment. 
One is pitch in continuous, um, continuously detecting pitch in uh, MIDI scale, which is 0 to 127. And here is envelope, which is the amplitude of the pitch in the dB scale. dB scale here is also 0 to 127. OK, so yeah. We will first hear how it sounds. Um, so yeah, so this first path, we only use one um, oscillator phaser uh, to regenerate the sound. So it's going to be not very rich because it just contains only one fundamental. So, and also this is multiplied by the amp amplitude, so we can hear amplitude change, but it's also going to be not so rich because it's only one uh, oscillator. Okay, now here is the grapher where um, it is operated by heating, um, of supplying the bang signal to here, and it is supplied by this uh, play sound. So every time I click over here or here, it, it will start um, start sound. So okay. Yeah. So first we will try with voice. So you can you can see that um, it's drawn here the pi uh, detected pitch, but because it's only the fundamental, the sound from he here is not very rich, right? And yeah, it's also just a phaser um, oscillation, not very realistic uh, oscillation. Okay, so I'll go over to the second uh, path, where we can um, where we use the sigma with the parameter notes, which says um, please detect the um, keep pressing event. So when you when you um, imagine you're playing piano, you know although there are sound in yeah many time scale, but um, there are these events where you you actually hit the uh, piano keys, right? So this is trying to detect that kind of uh, note hitting event. Okay, so it's not it's not continuous time. It will, yeah, spit some. Oh, you you have a note hitting event at this moment, at that moment, oh, something like that. So we'll see that effect in a second. And then um, this stable time parameter is um, so millis, uh, time in time in millisecond to wait to report uh, each note event. So there could be some very um, short um, short period of time w where um, some note is on, but it is not detected where when it is less than this stable time. So here is 50 milliseconds. So when, when note is present, but it's less than 50 milliseconds, it will not be no, um, reported. OK? And there are other parameters in this function which you will play with um, on Wednesday in order to yeah do some experiment. So I'll let you do that. and. show you one example of this. So here we will do the same thing. Oh, but then um, the note will be shown here, and it will go to the similar thing. But in this time, we will use the synthesizer that we um, played with in the 
previous uh, practical. So this will get more uh, realistic sound because it has this uh, attack, um, you know, decay things. So let's hear. Okay, so what we what we hear is more um, discrete events of notes rather than continuous, right? So yeah, this is the difference between um, the first one and the second second one. Okay. Okay, so now um, the, I'll go for the third path where we use uh, this parameter. We, Tracks, tracks. Uh, I'll put the uh, sinusoidal peaks organized into tracks. It's similar to spear that we um, saw in in the lecture. So uh, and also here we use parameter m peak of nine, which means that we will only uh, get nine uh, sinusoidal outputs. So. And then after uh, getting, um, doing the pitch tracking, it will route the output into nine of these sine oscillators. Th these are very simple oscillators where uh, we have this one oscillator per each sinusoidal oscillator, and each will have its own um, amplitude. So we will have, yeah, we will sum then over um, all nine uh, oscillators using this throw function. Then it will be kept, catch it by this catch function. So it will, yeah, go to the output. And the fade time um, is used in this um, function as uh, like um, transient, uh, how, how long with, uh, do you want your signal to be, I mean, how fast do you want to um, like reach that level, right? So this, when, when this fade, fade, uh, fade time is low, then your, your pitch will immediately follow what, what the pitch detector says. But when this value is large, then it will slowly follow the, the detected pitch. So let's try that. Oh, the difference um, is here we only detected one pitch, right? First one, first path and second path, we only detected one pitch. But in the third one, we are detecting nine pitches, right? So we will just draw one of the possible uh, value using this uh, unpack function. So how does it sound? It's pretty good, right? So the, the reason why maybe uh, it's got nine harmonics instead of just one fundamental, right? And although this, um, we can see some something is drawing, drawn here, uh, it's not the fundamental. So the first um, sinusoid is not maybe fundamental for many uh, many fr uh, many time frames, but uh, in some of the time frames. So that's what what is it's showing. I think it's pretty much um, what I want to say about this. Um, pitch tracking. So is there any question? You will uh, probably, yeah, uh, play with these um, like parameter um, changing and um, trying out with other uh, signals, input, your voice, things like that in the Wednesday, on Wednesday. Yeah. So no questions? then, yeah, today is over. Thank you.